Hello everyone and welcome to the Covenant intro lesson. I am going to be going through some administrative details, structure of the book, how it's going to work each week, and then I'm going to go through, as you can see, a timeline, a brief overview of the history of Israel. Um, and this is going to really set the stage for our study. So for those of you that don't know me or have never met me, my name is Sherry Hogriff. I am over the children's and the women's ministry at Providence Church here, um, and I'm going to be walking you through this covenant study each week. You may see my partner in crime who teaches the morning class, Nell Ann. Um, she has thought about maybe helping me. She doesn't prefer doing these videos, but I'm hoping I can convince her um, to help me do the summary videos. So uh, let's get started. Uh, the first thing you're gonna need is your covenant workbooks. Um, now, if you've already done covenant in the past, you might have a different looking workbook. The uh, cover pages were different in the previous version, but this is the version I have, it's brand new. Um, and we are using NASB. In just a minute, I'm gonna go over why we're using NASB. Um, and I do wanna walk you through what a lesson looks like. So for example, um, each, we, each week you go through, you're gonna have a lesson. This week, the uh, very first week, what I'm doing is an intro to the um, actual 11 week study, but you'll start doing the homework for lesson one this week through to next Wednesday. Next week, when you watch the summary video, that will be all about lesson one. So each um, lesson is broken up into five days. That's up to you to kind of be flexible and carve out some space for whatever works for you, okay? A lot of the days of homework, um, 20, 30 minutes will get you through, you know, a full day's worth. So there might be times when you have more time on a different day and you are more than welcome to combine lessons and get two days done in the same time frame. Totally up to you. Um, so you can see that as you go through, you can open up your books. Hopefully you've already kind of gone through and looked at the structure of each individual lesson. They've got a lot of cross references for you to look up, a lot of questions for you to think through that is gonna kind of help you get in tune with Covenant in general. Um, okay, an observation worksheet. If you ever hear me talking about an observation worksheet or I ask you to take out your observation worksheet on Genesis 17, an observation worksheet is just the text of the Bible printed out with extra space between and margins so that you can write on there or mark it up. I personally use a blend of pens, colored pencils and highlighters for when I mark certain things. So there might be a key word, obviously a key word we're gonna be marking in a lot of different texts is the word covenant. And you're gonna to wanna to mark it the same in each of your different observation worksheets. That just clues your eyes and therefore your brain in that when you see that word, you're going to want to be understanding the surrounding verses and the context that you're reading. But that that word covenant is going to be key throughout our study. So observation worksheets, that is part of your lesson. Now, this is an 11 week study. So this is your intro week. We're going to go all the way through April 19th. That will be our final Wednesday that we meet. So that, that week I'll do the final summary video for covenant. Um, the only time we won't meet is March, I think it's March 15th, and that is because here in Tennessee, that's our, that's our spring break for most of our public schools. Um, so we will not meet on that week. Okay, um, for me personally, I just wanted to talk about why we chose the study of covenant. I have done this study so many times, probably three or four times I've taken a study as a student. And I've taught it at least three or four times. And that's because the very, very first time I took this study, it was just mind blowing. Like every single lesson connected things in the Old and New Testament I had never connected before. So I had a lot of knowledge. I grew up in the home where my dad was a pastor. We were in church on Sunday and Wednesdays. I also did Awana. So I had a lot of knowledge about stories. I memorized a lot of individual verses, but it was very disjointed. My entire faith was very disjointed. I didn't even really understand how I connected to a foreign culture like Israel or being Jewish. I had no understanding of my part in that. Covenant 
is really a connector piece. So it takes a lot of these individual stories that when you read them separately, you might not see how they connect to one another, but when you study it in the, in the framework of covenant, it brings it all together. It kind of ties a thread between every story starting at the very beginning all the way through to the very end, and especially present day with you. So if you think about it like this, um, there's different ways to talk about being saved. You might say, I'm saved, I have been saved, or I have been forgiven of my sins, or I have confessed and become a believer. Maybe you've heard people say, you need to be born again. So there's all these different euphemisms and ways to talk about what it means to be saved. You might have even heard the term or the phrase, you need to be in a relationship with God. Okay. What I want you to know, and that you're going to find out in this study, is that if you are a follower of Jesus, you're born again, and you have been saved, you are in a covenant with God. That's the new covenant. We're going to talk about that in just a second. So this is this study, while yes, it's going to help you piece together and give you a framework with which to view all of the stories of the Old and the New Testament, it's also going to help you understand your part and bring you into the story. And even more than that, it's gonna help you know more about your relationship with God because he is your covenant partner. So what does that look like in your life? What does that mean? What can you expect from God? What does God expect from you? All of these questions over the next 11 weeks are gonna be answered. It's gonna be great, I think you're gonna love it. I personally have learned something new every single time I've either taken in this class as a student or taught it as an adult. Okay, um, also I wanna go over one thing. The There's gonna be one major theme that runs throughout this whole study and it's gonna be the idea of law versus grace. Okay, now I'm not gonna parse those out right now because we're gonna break those down further over the next couple of weeks. But what I wanna do today is talk about this idea of law versus grace with homework and what you're expected to do. So every single week, like I said, you've got approximately five days worth of work, sometimes less if you wanna combine lessons. The more that you do, the more that you will get out of this study the more personal time you invest into it. That's kind of a given with anything you do in life. The more effort, the more disciplined you are, the more you're gonna get. However, we all know that lives get busy, we get sick, things come in the way, there's vacations, there's obstacles that come up. So there's also grace in this and there's freedom. God's gonna use whatever you give him. If you have nothing to give him that week and you don't do any personal study and you simply come in and watch a video a su summarizing the key points of the lesson that week, God will use that in your life. So don't put yourself under the law and feel guilt and shame if you don't get all the homework done or even if you get none of the homework done. There is freedom here. Okay, God will use whatever it is that you can bring to him, even if that's just watching the video. But on those weeks where you are able to carve out more time, it will benefit you greatly to be able to actually work through the lessons on your own and think through these things as you answer the questions, think about how they connect with each other. So whatever that means for you, just make sure you don't put yourself under the law if you don't get something done. We wanna have complete freedom and grace here. This week, as you start and you work through lesson one, I do want you to know that this is gonna be an overview of covenant. You're gonna be bouncing around all over the Bible. And what you're gonna be doing is familiarizing yourself with just the idea of covenant. This is not the most popular term in our culture today. It was much more popular in ancient um, Israel in that time. So you're gonna be familiarizing yourself with just covenant in general. What the word means in Hebrew or in Greek, we're gonna look at it in context in scripture and see what we can learn from that. So it's an overview and when we come back next week, we'll walk through it together and kind of point out the key things. Okay, I think I'm gonna go ahead and start with um, our timeline. So just so you know, 
Um, we're going to be looking at the key plot points concerning where the covenants land in Israel's history. And you're also going to probably notice that the dates in earlier, as we get farther up the BC era um, to creation, closer to creation, you're going to see flexibility in the dates. But as we get further down here, you're going to see more concrete dates because at that point we have much more historical documentation and ancient literature with which we can pull from to make sure that we understand actual key historical dates that happened. So here we go. Let's get started. I'm going to start at the very beginning and just make sure we have a plot point for creation and Eden. Okay. So our very first point is Eden. Now, what you might want to do is actually go grab like a piece of paper or something. Just draw the straight line and a cross at the other end. And then do these plot points with me. That will help you as we go through the history for you to be having your own copy to write these things down. Or at the end of it, you can pause the video. I'll get out of the way and you can take a screenshot of the timeline and then print that off and put it in your book. Whatever works for you. Okay, so our very first covenant happens with Noah, and a lot of us are probably fairly, we're fairly familiar with the story of Noah. We are going to cover that this week as we look at covenants between God and man. But this is very concrete where we actually see God come to Noah in a time where the world was going crazy, and he makes a covenant with him and asks him to, asks him to do some specific things as a part of that covenant. So here we go. Next plot point on here is Noah. I put a green box around Noah just because that is a confirmed covenant on our timeline. Okay, so let's keep going. Next major figure in history that comes up in Israel's timeline will be Abraham. And that's a confirmed covenant as well. So we're going to do this. Now, I'm going to put a different color box around Abraham. Because the covenant that we have with Abraham is going to be one of our three big covenants of salvation that we spent a lot of time looking at. Now, we know that Abraham, that time frame is between 2000 and 1800 BC. And within the Abrahamic covenant, we see that God passes the covenant down through Abraham's son and grandsons and then all the way down with the 12 sons of Jacob. So I'm going to put on here that the covenant transitions down through Isaac, down through Jacob, whose name is changed to Israel, and then down to the 12 tribes, making it that the covenant with Abraham is passed down to the 12 tribes of Israel. The Abrahamic covenant is going to be huge. And so you're going to notice in the homework that we will bounce back and forth between different covenants, but we will consistently return to the Abrahamic covenant, even all the way to the end of the study. It will be one of our three major covenants that we spend a lot of time looking at. So after Abraham, there's a period of time, and then we have 400 years where they all of Israel is in Egypt, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and put on our plot point the next major covenant, which will be the covenant of law. This is also one of our three big ones. This is through Moses. He's the mediator. And the time frame for this is going to be 1600 to 1400 B.C., So I'm going to add the 400 years 
in Egypt. Okay, hopefully you're with me so far. I'm gonna pause here and check on the video and make sure that everything is still working before I move on. Okay, all is well, so we're gonna keep going. So we have just introduced the covenant of law that was given to Moses. This happens after the Israelites were freed from slavery in Egypt. Um, they meet at Mount Sinai. God gives them the Ten Commandments. And one key aspect of this covenant that we want to make sure that we understand is that part of the law of this covenant revolved around the worship in the tabernacle. So we're going to add the tabernacle. And I will say this, we're going to track all occurrences in the timeline um, that deal with worship of the tabernacle or the temple, as we'll see come up in just a bit. So here we go. Tabernacle. Now, if you remember, um, the tabernacle was when Israel were nomadic people. So the tabernacle was actually created in such a way that when God's Shekinah glory would lift up and away from the top of the tabernacle where they could see it, it would move to wherever it wanted them to go. They would literally be able to pack up the whole tabernacle, carry it to the next location, and then set it down, reset it back up again, and God's dwelling glory would come back and hover over the top of the tabernacle. So tabernacle existed as part of the covenant of law, and we'll definitely see that going forward. Now, after Moses, Joshua, of course, takes over in leadership and leads the people into the promised land that's going to be a huge part of the Abrahamic covenant. And then after they divide, they conquer, and they settle, where they go, all the 12 tribes settle and create Israel. We see that there's a period of 400 years where they are ruled by judges. Uh, some of the famous judges you might have heard of would be like Deborah, Gideon, Samson, things like that. So I'm going to go ahead and add another stopping point right here. And this we're going to call... Four hundred years under the judges. Okay, at that point, at the end of the four hundred years of judges, the people actually come to Samuel, who is the final judge and prophet, and ask him to give them a king. So, under the previous system, it was known as a theocracy. God's the king; the people are his people. That's the government they were under. What they're going to do now is go to a monarchy. So they want a king. They look at the nations around them when they're in the promised land of Canaan, and they ask for a king. So this becomes the time where we get the kings. This actually ushers in a 120-year period. Where they are a united kingdom. Okay. So I'm going to put that right here. What I mean by that is that all 12 tribes put themselves under the rule of one king. Now, if we think about the kings in the history, the first king was King Saul, then comes King David, then comes King Solomon. So King Saul did not last very long. He disobeyed. That led God to look for somebody new, and he takes it to David. Now, David had a desire within him to build God a dwelling place, an actual permanent dwelling place. But God said, no, there's been too much bloodshed in your kingdom and under your authority, but your son's going to build me a temple. So we are going to have our temple. I'm going to call it temple number one. And again, we're monitoring temple, and obviously there's going to be a connection between the tabernacle and the temple. They're still under the rule of the kings. They are still operating under this monarchy, but higher than that would be the covenant of law that was given to Moses. All of the kings are still required to abide by the conditions set under the covenant of law between God and Moses and the people of Israel, which we will see. Okay, so in 931 BC, we see that the kingdom divides. Okay, 
So we're going to have a divided kingdom, and this is how they're going to divide up. The 10 tribes in the north are going to retain the name Israel, and they're going to be the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom takes the name Judah, one of the largest areas of land and largest people groups in the 12 tribes was the tribe of Judah. So they take on the name Judah, and they are part of the two tribes that make up the southern kingdom. Okay, so let's get that on our board. So the southern kingdom is Judah. The northern kingdom is Israel. And as I said, this is the divided kingdom. This lasts for 400 years, okay? In the entirety of the history of the Northern Kingdom, there were 19 kings throughout that time. They were all bad. Not even one of them served the Lord faithfully or loved him with all of their heart like God set out to do, like what God says David did, right? David had a whole heart, a man after God's heart. None of the kings of the North did that. So I'm going to put 19 and zero because there's 19 kings, zero of them worshiped faithfully. And what happened was God kept sending them prophets. So while this is the period of the kings in the divided kingdom, this is also the period where the prophets are speaking. So God is sending prophets to the north. God is sending prophets to the south, telling them what God wants for them, calling them to repentance, calling them to faithfulness to the covenant of law, which they are continuously breaking with their idolatry, which we know God sees as adultery, right? cheating on him by breaking the covenant at the end of the time of the northern kingdom in 722 bc god says that's it i'm raising up assyria he had warned them and warned them and warned them they did not heed his warnings so in 722 bc the assyrian empire which has been in power for a long time comes down into israel conquers them and scatters the people the Assyrian king actually takes many of the people out of Israel and plants them in his other kingdoms that he rules and assimilates them away from Israel. And he brings other people that are not Israelites in to work the land. So in 722 BC, we see the Assyrians conquer Israel. The southern kingdom had 20 kings throughout their period of history. Eight were good, loved God, faithfully served him. The rest of them were bad. So we're going to put 20 and 8. At the end of that time, the kings of Israel, especially the last three, did not serve God. And this, basically the same process happened. You would think that they would learn their lesson by watching what happened in the north, but they did not. So after a set period of time and after so many warnings, God raises up the Babylonian Empire. So I'm going to shorten my line just a bit because this happens in 605 B.C. The Babylonians conquer Israel take them back to Babylon in three separate waves, and they're in exile for 70 years. You're going to want to pay attention to that number because it's obviously very important. Okay, so for 70 years, and actually, don't get mad at me. I'm going to change this just a bit so that we know... I put Assyrians scattered because the northern kingdom would never return to Israel in the same exact way they were before the Assyrians conquered them. But in the southern kingdom of Judah, the Babylonians conquer them, take them back to Babylon. They're there for 70 years. And then when Persia, the Persian Empire, rises to prominence and conquers the Babylonian Empire, the Israelites simply were transferred ownership over to Persia. And that's when we see that King Cyrus um, 
basically signs an edict that the Jews can return to their homeland. That happens in 586 BC. So they're out for 70 years, and then King Cyrus, the Persian king, signs the edict that they can return home, and this happens in 586 BC. Okay, um, I also want to point out that when the, the Babylonians, under the rule of King Nebuchadnezzar, when they conquered the southern kingdom of Judah, on the third wave, because it happened in three waves, they would come in, they would conquer, they would take some people back in exile to Babylon, they would leave some Israelites in the land to work the land. But each time they left people in the land, the new king that took over in the land would betray King Nebuchadnezzar until finally he comes in and he conquers Jerusalem completely, destroys the temple, knocks it to the ground, burns Jerusalem to the ground. Okay, big deal. So what we're going to learn is that at this time right here, temple number one is destroyed. Okay, so we see that we have that tabernacle, then we have temple number one built by Solomon, and then all the way over here, we're going to track that and we're going to see that that temple is destroyed by the Babylonians and by King Nebuchadnezzar, along with Jerusalem. Jerusalem was also burned to the ground. So, 70 years in exile, I'm going to add that exile. King Cyrus then declares they can come home in 586. In 516 BC, after they are returned to their land under people and the leadership of people like Zerubbabel, Ezra, Nehemiah, Nehemiah, we see that in 516 BC, they rebuild the temple. So we're going to go temple. I'm going to let you see this. Temple number two. Now, I want to be real careful to under, have you understand here. This was nowhere near as glorious or as magnificent as the temple that Solomon built. But at least they had a temple. Now, shortly after this, I'm going to go ahead and mark this real quick. We're going to put that this right here is like our zero marker. Okay? That means everything on this side is AD. Everything on this side, if you can see, it counts upward from zero. So we go up to 516, 586, 605. It keeps getting higher and higher on that side. That's the way our timeline works, okay? So here's the zero marker. We're going to put the cross at approximately, I don't know, 30 to 34 AD, give or take. We're not exactly sure what year Jesus was born. Some say zero. Some say 4 BC. So, depending on where exactly Jesus was born, we know we got to add 33 to 34 years to that. So, give or take somewhere in this reign. I'm also going to go ahead and put us on the timeline because we're all the way over here in 2023. So, we're going to get to us eventually, but that gives me a marker. So, between this part and about 400 BC, we have 400 years of silence. Now, what I mean by that is there were no prophets. God was not giving dreams, visions, messages. He was not getting, giving any new revelation of scripture that was recorded by the prophets. The final book in the Old Testament was the book of Malachi. And Malachi warns them that God is done with their adultery because what happened was it did not take very long once they returned to their land, rebuilt the temple, rebuilt the city of Jerusalem. And you can read about that in Nehemiah, rebuilding the walls and being secure again. It didn't take them very long to, to occupy and take up again the same exact patterns that they had been doing all the way through the divided kingdom and all the way through the period of the judges as well. Okay, All the same sins, idolatry, um, worshiping false gods and all of that. I'm going to add one more marker. So right about 20 AD, we've got King Herod. Actually, as he is asserted into the leadership over the Jewish people, even though they did not choose him, elect him, or want him, he took the current temple that was built back here in 516 BC, and he made some upgrades to it. So, temple number two is upgraded. Okay. 
So temple number two gets an upgrade under King Herod. Now, obviously with the cross, with the ministry of Jesus, the earthly life of Jesus, which we'll get into all, obviously through our study, we get the new covenant of grace. And hopefully, you'll be able to see that it's going to stand in opposition to the covenant of law. We're hopefully making that distinction. I'm also going to put a green square around David. That's another confirmed covenant that we have in Scripture. So, you've got your three big covenants of salvation. There are other covenants sprinkled throughout the timeline. There are covenants uh, that men make with each other. Maybe they're um, Abraham and Abimelech or Jacob and Laban or Joshua and David. So there's other covenants we're going to look at. These are the biggest covenants, the Noahic covenant, the Davidic covenant, and then, of course, in red, the three covenants of salvation, the Abrahamic covenant, the covenant of law, and the new covenant of grace. And that's where, throughout our study, we'll be spending the vast majority of the end of the study focusing on those three big covenants. Last but not least, we want to put on our board what happened in 70 AD. So if you think about it, you've got the Assyrian Empire, big empire, conquered by the Babylonian Empire. The Babylonians are conquered by the Persians, who are then conquered by the Greeks under Alexander the Great. And then Alexander the Great died young, and his kingdom was divided into four different areas and given to his top generals, which led to civil war in the Greek Empire for many, many years, until about 133 BC when Rome, who was already in power on the other side, comes in and kind of begins to conquer the Greek Empire piece by piece. Now, the Greek Empire, you could probably argue, weakened itself by fighting amongst each other. And then the Roman Empire comes in. Of course, Rome, one of the greatest empires, one of the largest with expansive territory, comes in and takes over the entire area. So when we see that Jesus actually comes during his lifetime, that's going to be the Romans that are ruling at that time. And the biggest thing we have is that in 70 AD, the Roman general Titus comes in, destroys Jerusalem and the temple again. So in 70 AD, put that right about here, we see temple number two destroyed. Want to point out that even to this day, there has not been another temple built. We have not seen temple number three. And I'll tell you right now, the Jews are waiting. They would love to build temple number three. Um, they have much of the temple furniture, artifacts, and animals ready to go should the opportunity present itself. But currently, there is a Muslim mosque on the, on the area, the Temple Mount area, where they're supposed to build the temple. It's called the Dome of the Rock. I'm sure you've heard about it. And there's even the fighting today that exists between the Jews and the Arabs in the Palestine lands. It's all going to be referred back to this over here. So even just modern day and cultural current things that we're dealing with on the news that we see all the time, I promise you, you will begin to see the connection that all of that has to these covenants and specifically to the Abrahamic covenant. Okay, so they're waiting right now. They would love to build their temple. The good news for them, there was one good piece of news that happened in 1948. So we're going to put that all the way over here. In 1948, Israel was granted statehood. Now, they do not have currently, under this law that was passed, all of the land they had back here. They do not have access to that. In fact, if you went to Israel right now, you would notice that even cities as popular as Bethlehem is, is operated and owned by Palestine, not the Jews. They want it, but it's not theirs right now. So Israel, Granted statehood. Okay, what I want to do now is just make some connections for you as we work through this. I want to show you how they connect. So, for example, I'm going to start with the covenant of law. 
One of the big things that we're going to see in the covenant of law was that there was rules that surrounded Israel's ability to stay in the land of Canaan, which was the promised land as part of the Abrahamic covenant. All that's going to come out, so don't get overwhelmed. But land is a big deal in the covenants, okay? Very, very big deal. So it's interesting because we're going to note that right up here in the covenant of law, this is directly connected to why Israel is kicked out here and here. So there is connections from the covenant of law to both of these pieces of history. So the reason that they are kicked out of their land is they are continuously breaking the covenant of law. So we're, we, we're going to see that throughout the history of Israel, certain things that happen to them as part of their history directly connect back to what we're going to learn in covenant. So Abrahamic covenant, for example, also involved promises surrounding the land and surrounding descendants, specifically one descendant in particular. So we can look at the fact that Abrahamic covenant also has connections. OK, one of the biggest first connections that the Abrahamic covenant has is the fact that there had to be a remnant that was brought back to the land. So this right here, this date very much connects to a promise God made to Abraham. So the Abrahamic covenant connects all the way back to the remnant of the southern kingdom of Judah that had been in exile and was brought back to the land. That has a direct connection to God's promises all the way back to the Abrahamic covenant. Not just that though, the new covenant and the promise of a special descendant that would bless the entire world as part of the Abrahamic covenant is ultimately fulfilled in Christ. So we see that even the new covenant acts as a fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. Not just that, our part of the story comes in as an ultimate fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. So I'm just gonna kind of jump off of this line right here. So ultimately the Abrahamic covenant also comes all the way full circle to us. So here's the interesting thing. When you step back and you look, now I'm going to get out of the way for a second in case you want to pause the video and take a screenshot of that board so you can have it in your booklet. You can print it off. Okay. There's your screenshot full board. What we see here is a historical timeline that demonstrates God's faithfulness through covenant. Hopefully you're able to see that because of the Abrahamic covenant and the connections all the way to current time. Also, if we wanted to, we could draw a timeline. We could connect the Abrahamic covenant all the way down to the statehood. Just the fact that they were granted their land back. Again, that's connected to the promises that God made to Abraham in the Abrahamic covenant. So we can look at this entire board, we can look at the history of Israel, and we can go, this is an example, a visual demonstration of the fact that God will be faithful to his covenant promises. In fact, Hebrews, it even inserts a stronger um, understanding for us about covenant where it says, if God has made an oath, he cannot lie, he cannot break it. That's why he swore by himself because he can swear by nobody greater. He's the one, if he says it's gonna happen, if he makes a promise to you, he will fulfill it. Now, in the very beginning, I also told you that we study covenant because ultimately we are in a covenant with God, the new covenant of grace. We're in that covenant. If we have confessed our sins, um, surrendered our lives, our wealth, our time, and everything about us down to our very lives and bodies, we are in that new covenant. We have received the gift of grace because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross, dying to defeat sin, rising from the dead to defeat death, offering us a chance to have eternal life in heaven. If we have surrendered to that and by faith received that gift, we're in a new covenant. So when we look at this and we go, we can see that God demonstrates that he will be faithful to his covenant. Then we can look at that for ourselves and go, I can know that I have a covenant partner who will be faithful to his covenant. And that is amazing news.
So as we continue our study over the next couple weeks, I pray for you that you will dive in deep and just start unpacking the riches and the layers of treasures that are waiting for you each and every week through this study. So starting today and all the way until next Wednesday, you'll be working on lesson one, looking at a general overview of what covenant is, where we see it in the Bible, and what we can learn from it. Okay, guys, have a great week.